the first day we were there, we visited uh, this outpost. It overlooks a long valley um, and watches out largely for arms transfers. The, the uh, outpost had been under fire the night before, and we were the first people to actually go and see how they were doing. Um, they were, hadn't had any sleep in about 24 hours and, and were a bit jumpy, but other than that, they, can treat, they treated it as fairly normal, and they showed us quite a few bullet holes around the place. I had the pleasure of uh, going on a fairly long tour, a full day spent in uh, these armored personnel carriers, uh, checking out villages, uh, seeing it. This is probably the only photograph that I would think of as an art photograph as opposed to just a documentary one, one I particularly like. And it's of the second crew. There were two vehicles, and this was the second vehicle just pulling up behind us and checking out a village. Um, at the end of that, we had an exhibition, uh, the three of us, um, and uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, most of these paintings I'm showing you are about five and a half foot square. The large one is about 11 foot by just under uh, nine feet. So if I say large painting, you get a sense of the scale here from the museum. And this is the large one. Uh, the museum, uh, pardon me, the church is a Serbian church. Um, a major battle had been fought there, and I think that's where I began to learn just how much hatred there could be in a particular area. The area, whole area was mined as part of the uh, defense, um, and it had, you can see the, uh, the red and white tapes where uh, Canadian engineers had cleared away so that the uh, local people could retrieve artifacts from their church. The rest of the church was, uh, we could go inside, but we couldn't go into the graveyards or anything because they were so heavily mined, although we were able to go in simply by hopping from tomb to tomb. Uh, but when you hop from tomb to tomb, you actually began to notice that bodies and so on had been pulled out. The hatred was so great there that in order to clear people out of an area, we wanted the, it was understood that you wouldn't even be able to come back to visit your ancestors. That, that whole notion was uh, destroyed. Each, we many times went through a small village where that church was. It was sort of at a crossroads and you needed to go through it to, uh, for everyone else. And so the very first painting I made was this picture of the second uh, personnel carrier following us through the village. The village, again, you could see, mine, you could see the mines and you could see uh, T-34 tanks flipped upside down and rusting and uh, show you some details. You can also see uh, that I was still using that notion of the angels because it seemed to me as watcher angels, the Gregori, were almost the exact metaphor for the, the uh, peacekeepers, is by watching, by looking down that valley, uh, by patrolling regularly, that a lot of the fighting calmed down. People knowing, if you will, there was a cop on the block were not going to do things they would otherwise do. Here you can see just another detail with the APC coming around the corner. This is the same ride I was on. I don't have a slide for it, but in the, in the show, there's a, an image of this second vehicle coming around the corner by that same church, which you don't see that obviously. It's in the trees. Another day I went out with a group of engineers and we uh, watched them clearing some deadfalls and uh, lifting some mines and clearing uh, some safe areas for uh, a group of Canadian soldiers who uh, were based nearby. Um, we were forced to get out of the vehicle and uh, stay 100 yards away just in case something made a loud noise. Um, one of the things I noticed, and nobody pointed it out, but after a while we noticed that everywhere we went, we keep, kept seeing this ambulance and suddenly realized that where these people worked, an ambulance followed them to work every day. And if you can imagine doing that for six months at a time, um, day in and day out, always having an ambulance 150 yards behind you, uh, you get a sense of the kind of stress they must have been under. A detail of the Croatian countryside. This is called Tragedy in a Country Road. Uh, it was a paved road, considered safe, but the uh, a mine had been inserted under the pavement from the ditch, and a Canadian officer uh, was killed there. And 
we had a different driver each day, and we went down that same road each day, and each driver stopped to tell us the story again and again. So it obviously affected their life quite severely. Now, while I was in Croatia, or with the PPCLI, we were told uh, that our trip to Sarajevo had been canceled because the airport was being shot up and that they weren't going to try and get an aircraft in. So we were quite disappointed. And um, like I suppose most of us, when you're told you can't do something, it makes you really want to do it. So a few years after the fighting had died down, uh, I went back on my own to Sarajevo. And I think the next few pictures uh, will show you a bit of that. This is the market where my hotel was, the, the old Turkish market. Uh, Sarajevo was primarily uh, Muslim, but the, there's large representations of the other, uh, the other religions, and they tended to get along there. And so, um, and the, I didn't take these photographs, but about the time I was in Croatia, this was what Sarajevo looked like. It was a very, very dangerous place to be, and you had to run for your life through certain intersections. You had to, you had to do it, or you wouldn't get water or food or bread. And so um, this was what life was like, taken by local photographers. In a very peaceful scene, this is the most dangerous street in Sarajevo. And the general sort of rule of thumb was, if you can see the hills, the hills can see you. And so uh, I had an exhibition of the, this work, simply called, If You Can See the Hills. And that the scene is almost like a hopper. It, just so peaceful. It's actually late afternoon light, not morning light, but you can see the, the, the beauty of it. Another very pleasant street uh, was a market street, a pedestrian mall, and as you can see, people are wandering around and enjoying the, the, the war is over. Um, it looks like a normal street, like the mall in Calgary where I lived. And the only difference would be, if you look in the foreground on the, on the sidewalk, you can see two little patches of pink. And that patches of pink means a mortar or a, a shell of some sort landed there and killed somebody. And so these are the kinds of things you notice. There were, you looked at, we looked at a lot of ruins and things like that. But um, it was those things that seemed the most meaningful. And this particular spot um, about five years earlier, looked like this. Uh, there were 22 people killed at that spot. That's where people lined up to get bread early in the morning. Uh, the gunners knew exactly where that spot was and aimed for it at the worst possible time. Uh, I don't know how many casualties total there were, but as I say, 22 deaths. But it led to a strange sort of myth uh, about a person coming home from the opera. He was a cellist, walked by that spot and he was so moved that he, he kind of lost it. He went home, he put on his full tuxedo, and he went back to that spot, and he played the cello every day for an hour for 22 days, one for each victim. And it had a huge effect on the local population that you could sort of stand up to the despair and the hunger and the constant killing. Uh, there's a picture of him, his name is Smelovich, and he's uh, toured playing uh, Albinoni's Adagio, which is what he played over and over, day after day. 